Today's event is called Connection to Conversion, Building Your Bottom Line from the Top. It implies a high-level starting point with a profitable end result. Now, marketing is a pretty big world, have you noticed? I mean, marketing is just enormous, and of course with electronic media, marketing has just expanded tremendously in, in our lifetime, and sometimes things get foggy. There are so many options in marketing that sometimes it's difficult to see clearly. It doesn't help that as small business owners we're faced with so many things it's impossible to keep up. As business owners we wear a lot of different hats. I like to say that we are all IT people. Why? Because, well, if there's human resources, we do it. If there's something related to uh, production, customer service, billing, taxes, we do it. So until we learn to delegate and get more people, we're doing it. So I like to say the small business owners, we are all IT people. And it's easy to fall into the trap of getting pulled into tactical thinking and tactical considerations instead of working from a viewpoint of strategic clarity. But having clarity is a huge advantage in life and in business. There's a theme that shows up in some of my conversations with Bill Prinette and some of the others in e for e We like to talk about the idea of systems and processes. I'm a firm believer that order is a whole lot better than chaos. Can you relate? I like order a whole lot better than chaos. Order brings clarity of thought that leads to better planning and better execution. So systems, processes, and methodologies turn chaos into order and it makes life and business better. Today I want to share a concept with you. It's an approach to help you think strategically about your business in ways that then can be applied tactically. We'll talk about your brand, and we'll talk about finding the sweet spot of your business, and we'll talk about how it applies to your marketing efforts in general, and then specifically we'll talk about how it relates to your website, your web performance, and your rankings. Business DNA is a process that's designed to help you do three things. Make marketing easier, attract more of the business you want, and enjoy higher profit margins. Now this morning I'll take you through some of the key elements of the business DNA process. So here's a heads up. We're going to cover a lot of material today. And so I'm going to ask you to, uh, you want to take notes, but pay attention. But here's a bonus. We are recording today's session. And this will be on the E4E website. So uh, you'll have access to, on the free side, you'll have access to a portion of the presentations. But as an E4E member, then you would have access to the entire presentation along with everything else in the membership site. Membership is only, it's under $100 a year. It gives you uh, access to everything that we have and half price on these events. So. I said all that to say that we are going to run kind of fast with this presentation today. So put on your seat belts and let's get ready to have some fun this morning. There are three points behind the theory of business DNA. The first point is this. Your business is at its best when you're working from its sweet spot. What do I mean by a sweet spot? How many of you have ever played a racket sport here? Let me see your hand. So I used to play racquetball. When I was younger, faster, and thinner, I played a lot of racquetball. And I discovered that with every tennis racket, racquetball racket, there's something called a sweet spot. And it's somewhere in the middle of the racket. And the sweet spot is where when you hit the ball in your sweet spot, that's where you get the most power and accuracy from your stroke. Well, what does that have to do with business? What is a business sweet spot? Well, when you're in your business sweet spot, it means that you're addressing needs that people really have. And you're providing goods and services that you can consistently deliver well. It also means that you're not trying to meet needs that people don't really have. And it also means that you're not trying to deliver goods and services that are outside of your core strengths. Sometimes the things that we say no to helps us as much as anything. 
So the second point behind the theory of business DNA is this. You are far more likely to attract the business you want and filter out the business you don't want when your marketing communications reflect your business sweet spot and speak directly to your customer's interests. Then there's a third point behind business DNA, and that's this. Your margins and your bottom line will improve when you learn to compete on value rather than on price. So let's dig into business DNA. People ask me, well, what is business DNA? One of the ways that I like to answer that question is by telling the story of why I developed business DNA. And in order to do that, I'm going to talk about a fictitious client, and I'm going to call him George. Now, it could also be Georgette or Georgia. A lot of lady business owners these days. We've got some in this room. But because George is stuck in my head, I'm going to, I'm going to keep with George. George is a motorcycle guy. George has loved motorcycles ever since he was a little kid. He loves everything about motorcycles. He likes to ride them. He likes to fix them. He likes to buy them. He likes to sell them. George is absolutely nuts about motorcycles. So George grows up and he starts a motorcycle shop. And so what happens is a few months in or a few weeks in, it occurs to him, oh, the marketing people out there tell me I need a logo. How do I get a logo? Joan, my secretary, looks like she's having fun with her computer. Joan, can you design a logo for me? She, sure, George, that sounds like fun. I'll do that. So Joan designs a logo for him. And then a, a few weeks later, he hears, oh, the marketing guys are telling me I need a website. How am I going to get a website? Ah, Johnny, my nephew, he's studying web design in high school. I'm going to get Johnny to help me. So he says, Johnny, I want a website. This is what we want to say. And then a few months later, he hears about this motorcycle rally that's going to take place. And he says, I should use, I should get a brochure so I can hand it out at the motorcycle rally. How am I going to, Sam, my friend, the printer, Sam, he can design a brochure for me. So here we are and George has his logo and he has his brochure and he has his website and they don't look like they belong together at all. There's no visual continuity, there's no conceptual continuity, and what happens is this is pretty typical of small business owners and let's face it, we come by it honestly. We're trying to save a buck, we're, we're, you know, we don't have super deep pockets, but this is pretty common in the small business world and, and in my work with clients I, I noticed this and I noticed several problems that have come up. George doesn't really know the essence of who he is and what he does. I mean, sure, he's a motorcycle guy, but, but beyond that, he doesn't really, he hasn't captured the essence of what he's all about. He doesn't know how to appeal to customers very well. He doesn't know what makes him stand out. He, he doesn't know how to differentiate himself very well among competitors. And every time he tries to create a new marketing piece, he scratches his head and just starts from scratch. He's wasting a lot of time and effort. He has no documented foundation for his marketing efforts and his marketing communications. So I noticed this problem out there and I created a methodology, a system. I call it business DNA. Business DNA helps your bottom line in three ways. When you discover the sweet spot of your business and you apply yourself to the right stuff, inevitably you're going to become more profitable. The second thing is when you communicate more directly to your, to your customer's interests, you're more likely to attract them and do business with them. And the third thing is when you learn to compete on value rather than price, you'll enjoy bigger margins. And yes, I am repeating myself a little bit. Some things that are important to, to learn and know bear repeating. So sometimes I repeat myself. So I'm going to talk today. I'm going to talk to. I'm going to talk through some of the aspects of business DNA as I'm working through it with clients. We're going to uh, one way. One way to describe business DNA is that it's the intersection of your customer's interests and what you have to offer. Finding the sweet spot of your business is about defining that intersection. Well, let's unpack that a little bit. It's been said that a great marketing effort starts with this question, what do people want? 
Goods and services are then developed to satisfy customer needs and interests. So we have this first circle, the circle on the left, represents your customers and their interests. And then there's the other circle that represents your strengths and what you have to offer. Where those two circles intersect, that is the sweet spot of your business. That's your business DNA. It's the seat of life for your company. The sweet spot is where you can make your promise, deliver well, and consistently satisfy customers at a profit that's agreeable to you. Finding what belongs in each of these circles, well, that's part of what business DNA is all about. Now, typically, when I work through business DNA with a client, there are nine steps. We're only going to cover the four main steps today. We're going to talk about business segments, customer segments, customer needs and interests, and business distinctions. Let's start with the business segments. I'm going to start with a question, though. Why is it important to segment your business? Why bother? I mean, isn't your business just your business? Well, there are both internal reasons and marketing communication reasons why you want to segment your business. You want to divide your business into logical parts so that you can manage and track your business portfolio. Each aspect of your business or each product group might make a different contribution to your success. You may want to promote them differently or at different times. There may be longer or shorter sales cycles with different products. There may be different profit, profit margins. There may be seasonal sales, things of that nature. Let's use George's motorcycle shop as an example. We can break down George's business into three basic components. There are big ticket sales of motorcycles, and then there's the service department, and then there are accessories, meaning helmets, clothing, things of that nature. And in the winter, when big ticket sales are maybe down, George can promote the service department. He can encourage people to come in and say, hey, don't miss out on any riding time in the nice weather. Bring your motorcycle in and get it repaired, get it fixed up, get it tuned up now in the, in the wintertime so you're not missing out on any riding time. During the gift-giving holidays, George might want to promote affordable accessories that people can buy for their loved ones. And maybe those, maybe those accessories have higher profit margins. So these different aspects of his business, these different product groups, he wants to track, manage, and promote differently. So those are examples of business segments. Let's talk about customer segments. Customer segmentation, very simply, is about dividing customers into logical groups. Well, why would you do that? Why would you want to give that much thought? Customers are all equal, aren't they? Maybe, maybe not. Customers are all the same, aren't they? No, they're not. Motorcycle riders are not all the same. Well, let's look at some examples. I'm going to use Paul and Jill as an example. Paul and Jill are professionals with great jobs and advanced degrees. They live in a very nice house in one of the nicest parts of town, and they have three kids. And the kids are involved in sports and school activities, and the family likes to go to the beach on occasion. And so for Paul and Jill, their motorcycle is part of their occasional weekend recreation. Now we're going to look at my friend Zeke. Now Zeke is a great guy, but he's a different character altogether. He's got this long ZZ top looking beard. He's got tattoos all up and down his arms. He works in a machine shop. And George's life is defined by his bike. He's a hardcore biker. So when you compare Paul and Jill to Zeke, their motorcycles are, are in their world in a different way. They have different interests. They have different buying motivations. And so your marketing communications will be more effective when you learn how to speak more individually to their heartbeat. Now that's just one example of how customers can differ. Let's, took a, let's take a look at some segmentation categories that you can use as possibilities. There's age, there's gender, there are interests, there's life stage, there's geography. Your business might have other ways to segment customers. So we've talked about the first two stages. We've talked about business segmentation, and we've talked about customer segmentation. 
Let's get back to the circles in our, in our little uh, icon here, the little business DNA icon. Each circle, uh, there, there's uh, the two circles. That, how do we know what belongs in each of those two circles? There's the customers, there's the business side. How do we know what belongs in each of those circles? Well, that's the next two steps. That's the customer needs and the business distinctions. Let's start with customer needs. This, that's represented by this circle here. But why do we need to give it special thought? I mean, isn't, just always, isn't it always just very apparent? What do they need? Well, they're buying my widgets. They need my widgets. That's what they need. Well, I think it's important to look below the surface to give it some more special consideration. Why is that? Well, because we're creating marketing communications. We want, to, we want to speak to them, to their interest, to their heartbeat. And it's not uncommon in life and in business for communications to miss the mark. You remember the telephone game? You sit in a circle, whisper in somebody's ear. By the time it comes around back to you, there is no similarity between what you said and what you hear. I'll give you a couple of other examples. I was, uh, I was in the Philippines doing a series of presentations and I was in a remote area and I happened to notice in this little grocery store, believe it or not, they sold spam. On the shelf I see cans of spam. Well, my lightning fast mind, I think I'm going to use this as an illustration. And I was talking about two different qualities of life. I'm talk talking about a higher quality of life and a lower quality of life. And a higher quality of life is characterized by good decisions and discipline and good habits and living constructively. And that's like eating steak. On the other hand, you've got a life where you're making bad decisions and addictive behavior and you're headed the wrong direction and it leads to a lower quality of life and that's like eating spam. And I'm getting all these weird looks from people. And at the end, one of the leaders comes to me and he says, you got that all wrong. That analogy does not work here at all. Why? Well, we like spam. It's an American packaged product that we admire and we like it. Well, number two, we don't differentiate between different cuts of meat like you do. You're talking about steak and other... For us, it's just all beef. Let me give you another story. Again, this is from the Philippines. There was a husband and wife missionary couple. They were relating something that happened that I thought was pretty humorous. Uh, the, the, the wife, she was, we'll call her Sherry, she was doing a series of presentations on an island and she was talking about how you don't have to be oppressed and depressed, but you can have freedom. Now, I'm getting some of the details wrong, but you'll, you'll get the point. So she was talking about how you can have freedom, and so she's working through an interpreter, and she figures out that whenever the interpreter is, is translating the word freedom, he uses the word iwi iwi. So she's letting him interpret, and then they go to a different part of the island. She picks up on this iwi iwi, and she says, I want to incorporate that so I can relate to the people better. So she's, in, she's giving her presentation. You don't have to be down and depressed. And he's interpreting. You can have iwi iwi. And people are looking at her funny. And there's a guy in the front row sitting next to her husband, and he's cracking up. Well, come to find out, the guy tells the husband, on our part of the island, iwi iwi means chicken butt. <laughs> so, so I said all that to say that communications can fall short. Our communications are sometimes flawed because we're speaking from our own perspective. We see through our own lens. And compared to our customers, our lens is kind of distorted. We, see, we should see what we need to do is turn the lens around and see through our customers, see through the ends of our, see through the lens of our customers' needs and interests. So it's about presenting our company in light of what they want and what they need and what they're interested in. Instead, sometimes we fail and we just talk about our products and our services and how great we are. You know what? Our customers don't care about our products and services. They don't give a rip, except as it benefits them. They're asking one basic question, W-I-I-F-M. It's not a radio station. I know that some of you here know what that stands for. Can you tell me? What's in it for me? Wow, a lot of you know what that stands for. That's right, that's exactly right. What's in it for me? That's the basic question that they're asking. So marketing communications is partly about speaking to pains and aspirations 
It's about highlighting the results and benefits that people get. I'm going to give you an example. People who know me well know that I am a fanatic on endurance sports car racing. I, I absolutely love it. So on occasion, I have the opportunity to go up to Wisconsin to a racetrack called Road America. And I was up there a few years ago, and while I was thinking about all this business DNA stuff, and I opened up the event program, and I saw this ad for the Toyota minivan. And what you see in this ad is a top-down view of the minivan, and you see behind the tailgate there's that fan-shaped thing. And in the fan-shaped thing, there's, there's a mailbox, there's a, a parking meter, there's a fence, there's some other items. I'm, like, I'm thinking, what is, what's that, what is that? What's that got to do with the minivan? And then at the top, you see the words anger management. Well, now I'm really scratching my head. I'm thinking, what does anger management have to do with it? And then I read the fine print. What they're presenting is not the technical specification of the minivan or anything else. They're talking about the rear view camera that's a full 180 degrees, wider than any of their competitors. So what they're doing, they're not talking so much about the camera, they're talking about that problem that you have when you run over your kid's bike and he's screaming like a maniac. So they're solving that problem for you. So that's an example of how, how they're appealing to customers' needs, wants, and interests and not how great our specifications are. So that's why we want to know what belongs in that circle of customers' interests, but how do we know? Is there a method? Is there a process? Well, certainly we can use surveys, questionnaires, we can have face-to-face -face conversations, and all of that is important. Sometimes guessing isn't all bad, or surmising, fancier word for it. Uh, sometimes that's what we're left with. All right, especially when we're starting out. But that's not all bad. But is there some way to help our guessing or our surmising? Well, there are some ideas. First of all, you can just start thinking about two things, pain points and aspirations. You can ask questions like, well, what does our product do for them? What do they gain? What problems do they solve or what problems do they avoid? There's another way that we can look at it. There's a book called Neuromarketing by Patrick Renvoss and Christoph Morin. And it's mostly a business-to-business -business book, but what I'm going to share here I think is relevant no matter what kind of business you have. But they talk about three kinds of pain. Now that's their terminology. Again, I like to think both in terms of pain and aspiration. But they, think, they, they talk about three different kinds of pain. There's financial pain, strategic pain, and personal pain. Well, financial pain is pretty self-explanatory. It all has to do with economic benefit. Gaining money, saving money, preventing the loss of money, things of that nature. I gain financially when the new air conditioner I buy saves on my electric bill. In the book, they talk about strategic pain, which really relates more business to business. It has to do with solving business problems like gaining market share or improving quality or, it, or decreasing risk, or acquiring and retaining the best talent, things of that nature. And then personal pain just relates to personal sensibilities. I feel a sense of pride and satisfaction when my lawn company makes my front yard look greener. We can also look at customer needs from another angle. And there's a marketing professional, Laura Lake, in Kansas City. She wrote a book called Consumer Behavior for Dummies. She talks about different buying motivations, and she gives us a list in her book. She talks about basic needs, convenience, safety and security, self-image, ego, and then, of course, there's my favorite, fun. So let's get, inter get interactive just for a couple of minutes. What are some examples of basic needs? Just shout something out. What's an example of a basic need? Shelter. Shelter? Okay, well, security is, is one of the things on the list. Coffee. What is it? Coffee. <laughs> Coffee. Coffee could be a basic need. <laughs> for, some, for a lot of people, it is a necessity. What's an example of a convenience? What is it? 
cleaning tools, mops, cleaning tools. What about maybe drive-in drive coffee places? <laughs> <laughs> so what's an example of security and safety? Insurance, rear view cam, great. Dave, that's great. <laughs> Funny thing, I developed this presentation, I didn't even, didn't even think about that. So those are some different examples. Now Laura goes on in her book to talk not just about the categories, but she also talks about positive and negative motivations. Let me give you a couple of examples. I already told you I'm a car guy. I have a recreational car that I absolutely love to drive on hilly, twisty roads. I absolutely love it. So I had this desire, this aspiration to improve the handling characteristics of my recreational car. So I had the suspension upgraded and I gotta tell you, it handles just amazingly now. The car just begs to go into the turns. I'll be driving down, the, driving down a twisty road and go to turn it in and it's almost like my car talks back to me says, is that all you got? Come on, push me harder, push me harder. And so that's an example of a, of a positive motivation. I wanted to get something that was interesting to me. Then on the negative side, every one of us, insurance was mentioned. Somebody mentioned insurance here. Every one of us, we buy insurance on our cars. Why? Because we're concerned about the possibility of an accident or a loss. So that's a negative motivation. So we can use those different principles, those categories and all those different, we can use those principles to help us to guess or surmise and think through the possible things that our customers might want and need and to, and to develop intelligent questions that we can ask them about their buying motivations. So we've done the customer side, let's do the business side. And the basic question is what makes you different, better, and more attractive? Do we have a, a system? Do we have a, a way of figuring that out? Well, it seems like it should be easy. Shouldn't we automatically know what belongs in that service? Shouldn't we circle? Shouldn't we automatically know what makes us different and better and, and more attractive than anybody else? It's not always so easy. The fact is, we are so close to our business that it's often difficult to be objective. I was talking with a gentleman that works for a creative agency. This goes back about three or four years ago. He was working for a creative agency. And he said, we went through a rebranding process. We were doing things a little bit differently and we wanted to rebrand ourselves and become known a little bit differently. And we had to hire another agency to help us with that. Well, isn't that what you do? Well, yeah, that's what we do, but we were so close to our own business, we really couldn't see it clearly. We needed an objective, outsider to help us think through this. So is there, I, I developed a process to help me help my clients through their business distinctions or differentiators or whatever word you want to use. I use the word distinction. So I developed a process and I divided these distinctions into three different ways that a company can stand out. There are philosophical distinctions, there are mechanical distinctions, and there are virtual distinctions. And each of these distinctions give a different reason for people to say yes to you and be attracted to you. Buying choices are not always about price. I mean, price is sometimes a factor, but buying choices are not always about price. You can actually increase your price when you demonstrate more value. Well, let's break these down. Let's start with the philosophical distinctions. Philosophical distinctions have to do with values, beliefs, maybe a, a, a special approach to the way you do business. And it gives people an opportunity to say, yes, I like that. I can, I can relate to that. That resonates with me. I like that about them. That's attractive to me. An example that I like to use is Panera. They display their sense of social responsibility with their line, live consciously, eat deliciously. You may not know this, and I don't know if this is true of all Panera stores, but, but I know that at least some of the stores, at the end of the day, when they close and they have leftover bread, they give it to charity. And without getting into all the details, they have some other things they do that are very community conscious, and there's a lot of goodwill in the way Panera does things. And it gives people an, an opportunity to say, 
I like that about them. That's kind of an endearing quality to me. So there's a, it creates kind of a magnetism for some people. Experts for entrepreneurs. Here we are in an E for E meeting. And we're benefiting from experts for entrepreneurs. I worked with Bill Purnett to work through the business DNA of experts for entrepreneurs. And in the process of our discussions, there were five key philosophical points that surfaced that were unique to his vision and what he was picturing in experts for entrepreneurs. Here are those five key philosophical points. The first one is what you don't know will kill you. The second one is success is not random. And then knowledge beats information, causes trump symptoms, and community is better than isolation. So you can, of course, read more about those on the E4E website. But those are examples of, of their, their, what it's meant to do is when those things are expressed, there are people that can say, you know, I can relate to that. There's some of those pieces that, that resonate with my heartbeat. And so if you want to develop your philosophical distinctions, you can start by simply asking questions like, what are our core beliefs? What are we passionate about? Do we have a unique perspective or a different approach to the way that we do business? What do we value most? Things like that you can ask yourself. So that relates to the philosophical distinctions. Let's move on to the mechanical distinctions. Now, mechanical distinctions have to do with the way people interact with you or your product. With you or your product. Not just your product, but the way that they interact with you as well. And it may be tangible. Oftentimes it's intangible. And it gives people the opportunity to say, oh yes, I like that. About, I like the way that works. That, I like that. I, that's attractive to me. The way that works is attractive to me. Great Clips is an example. So on my phone, I have an app for Great Clips. And wherever I am, if I want to get a haircut, wherever I am, I can go to my Great Clips app. And I can see where the nearest Great Clips, Great Clips locations are. I can see their address, there's their phone number. I can even see the approximate wait time. I can even check in online so I don't have to wait as long when I get there for a haircut. That's a way in which I interact with them. It's intangible, but it's a great benefit. It makes me say, oh, I like that about them. I want to do business with them. Amazon is an example I love to give. I love shopping. Do you ever shop on Amazon? How many shop on Amazon? I love shopping on Amazon. Now, other companies have started picking up on some of the things they do. But what I like about Amazon is that they keep my billing information on file. They keep my shipping information on file. So I don't have, I don't have to enter it fresh each time. And they also have the wish list. Don't you love the wish lists? I've got several wish lists. I've got one for me. I've got one for my business. I've got one for my wife. There's books. There's music. I've got all these different wish lists. So I don't have to have some kind of piece of paper off to the side where I'm keeping track of what I'm interested in. So Amazon is a great example of mechanical distinctions. Now those are, those are both intangible examples. Let me give you a tangible example. The Rolex watch company, they developed the first waterproof, uh, the first self-winding waterproof watch. And it all has to do with the winding stem. So, and they, they developed this years ago, now there are other people doing it, but, but they developed the first one, the winding stem screws down so that you can take a shower, you can swim, you can dive, you can do whatever you want in the water. And that water is not going to penetrate into the internal workings of the watch. Now that is a tangible example of a mechanical distinction. It's so old, I probably need to come up with a, with a new one. But that's, if you want to work through your mechanical distinctions, you can simply ask questions like, do we have unique features to our product? Is there a unique, unique way in which people interact with us? Do we have a unique, a unique process? What promises can we make and keep? And a lot of times when you're working through this stuff, you might not just discover things that you have, but you might discover opportunities to develop things that are different than your competitors. So we've looked at philosophical and mechanical distinctions. Let's look at virtual distinctions. Now don't get hung up on the word virtual, meaning like virtual reality or anything. 
Virtual, in this case, I simply mean special experience or special knowledge or certifications, things of that nature. And it gives people an opportunity to say, oh yes, I like that about them, I can trust them. Let me give you a couple of examples. In the automotive world, ASE certification gives people the opportunity to say, all right, I can trust these guys because, because they've been through this process of certification, that means that I can be pretty sure they're going to fix my car properly. Another example, Fred Weber Chevrolet, I've been hearing their ads on the radio, and they've talked about just how many employees have been there for a long time. And two things about that, there's that combined years of experience. And then you think, boy, if their employees have been there that long, they might be good people to do business with. So that's an example of a virtual distinction. When they express that, that's attractive to me. So that's, how, that's about the uh, virtual distinctions. Here's where we've gone on our adventure so far. We've talked about the four key components of business DNA. We've talked about business segments, customer segments, customer needs, and business distinctions. We've talked about philosophical, mechanical, and virtual distinctions. And we've talked about the philosophy and the process of business DNA, but how do we apply it? We've talked about just the, the theory behind it. You remember what I said about the experts for entrepreneurs' philosophical distinctions. One of them was knowledge beats information. What, do, what does that mean? Knowledge beats information. Well, when we sit in a room like this and hear and take notes and nod our heads, we're getting information. It becomes knowledge real, true, working knowledge when we do something with it, when we apply it. And I don't know, if you're like me, I've got reams of notes that I've ne never done anything with. But I want to talk not just about the theory of business DNA, let's talk about uh, some, some different ways to apply it. Well, the first thing I want to share is that it's important to get help. Remember that agency story I told you? Sometimes you need the help of an, of an objective third party to help you work through this stuff. So get some kind of help from, from somebody. The second thing is to document it. If you just have it up in your head, guess what? It's not, it's not going to work very long. It's going to become a tangled mess, just like a lot of other things that are up there. So document your business DNA. And then apply what you learn. So we, you, you know that there are uh, the, the distinctions, there are the customer needs, there are the segments. Look at the documentation of your business DNA and apply that through your marketing communications. So you can use it to develop your tagline, your web copy, sales presentations, elevator speech, um, ad copy, your unique selling proposition. You, once you have it recorded, and you need to develop a new communication piece, you have something to go back to. And then you can have that, that continuity between everything that you're, that you're saying. You can also use it to develop your content plans, and of course your email campaigns. But let's talk about some specifics as it relates to your website. Remember early on I said I'm gonna share about how it relates to your website. Let's talk about that a little bit. Well, the first thing is to develop personas. How many of you, have you ever heard of personas? A few of you have. Caesar Keller with Simple Flame, he's talked about this before. He's, he's, he's good at talking about it, he's good at doing it. So he's talked about that before. And actually on the E4E website, there are a handful of videos that Caesar has done where he's talked about personas. So I'm gonna encourage you to check those out. But personas, what a persona is, is a, it's a person that you invent that is representative of a person who visits your website. There may be three, there may be four, there may be five different kinds of people and the mindset that they have and, and who they are and their, and their lifestyle. So developing personas is something that you can more easily do when you've developed your business DNA because you can see things a little bit more clearly. I'm going to turn the corner for just a few minutes 
and talk about how business DNA can affect or impact your website, and the performance of your site, and the ranking of your site. Now, I will admit that I am not an SEO expert. We do have one in the room. Will Hanke is here. So I listen to guys like Will, and, and I reach kind of high-level conclusions about things. And so I generally think of SEO as having three different pillars or three different primary aspects. And you've heard of some of these. There's on-page considerations, off-page considerations, and then there's human behavior. And I'll try to give you a very, very simplistic history of, uh, of algorithms, of search engines. So early on, Google says, how, how do we know what we're going to rank any given page or site for for whatever keywords. Well, we're just going to pay attention to what the page says about itself. That's a pretty good clue. What they say about themselves should tell us what should rank well. It became apparent before long that that could be easily manipulated and deliver a search result that the searcher really didn't care about. And what you have to know is that Google's a lot more interested in serving their searchers than they are us as web owners. Why? because it's the searchers they're trying to serve. The searcher is the customer, unless you're paying Google for AdWords, but, but the searcher is the person that they're interested in serving. If, ser if people who are searching find what they're looking for, Google says, we're on the right track, people will stick with us. If people search for stuff and don't find what they're looking for, guess what? They're gonna find another search engine. So Google's interested in delivering the search results that searchers want. So when it became apparent that on-page considerations could easily be, be manipulated, Google says, we got a clue. We're going to look also at what other people say about this website and how they link. And after a while, it became apparent that that could be manipulated as well. So they changed the weighting of their algorithm, and then they started including more human behavior. What do I mean by human behavior? Well, if you type in motorcycle shop, and you go to George's old website, it's confusing, you're not sure if it really applies to you, it doesn't really appeal to you that much, see you later. Well, Google says, clue, somebody shows up using motorcycle shop, they didn't stay, they apparently didn't like what they found, George's shop is not gonna rank very well for that keyword. On the other hand, if somebody has a website, type in motorcycle shop and oh, well, that, that appeals to me, that appeals to me. I can easily navigate and find what I want. There are several things that appeal to me. I'm going to stick around for a while. Google says, clue, searcher found what they wanted. We're going to, we're going to, use that, we're going to let them rank well for that keyword. So how does that, what does that have to do with DNA, and what is it that influences human behavior? I think Will is probably going to get into this a little bit more, more technically than I can. But I think about three different things that can influence the actions that people take on your website. There's the layout, you know, the visual aspect of the site, there's the navigation, is it easy, is it logical, do people find what they want? And then of course there's the content. What do you say? Is it appealing to people? Or are you just talking about yourself? So how it relates to business DNA, when you've documented your business DNA, you can then take that to your web designer and say, well, this is what we believe we know about ourselves. So let's use this as a foundation to develop the language, the layout, and the navigation of our website. We don't have to just scratch our heads and guess. We have a foundation to work from that is also consistent with our other marketing materials. So business DNA is a tool, it's a system that you can use to make marketing easier, to attract more of the business you want, and enjoy better margins. So before we take a break, I think we've got just a few minutes for some questions.